So I'm, I'm also excited to present you the latest uh, advanced on the, on the research going on uh, at EPFL in the lab of Tobias Kippenberg on uh, combining an ultra narrow uh, line with laser with temporal soliton uh, in a microresonator to generate uh, low noise microwave generation. And on that project, we are also collaborating with Menlo Systems that's providing the ultra narrow line with laser. So we'll start uh, by introducing uh, the, the microresonator physics and the, the, the process of pure frequency comb generation. Uh, then explain how we narrow the pump laser line width, but still manage to get uh, solid tones and, and show some first results we, we had on that. And then how that raised a kind of problem and, uh, and, and led us to, to define a way to probe and control the, the solid tone state and where we now stand and what are the, the current issues we are facing. Okay, so probably uh, when you I mean, this conference, when you're hearing like optical uh, frequency combs and, micro, uh, and microwave, you probably immediately, immediately think uh, of the concept of optical frequency division, where you take the frequency comb uh, resulting from a, from a pulse, uh, from a pulse, pulse modlock laser, um, and so you stabilize it to, to, to reference, uh, optical reference, and then also detect the, the offset of the comb, and uh, the, the corresponding rapid chain rate of the of the um, of this comb basically reflects uh, the, the the stability of the optical uh, reference enhanced by uh, this factor n, which is the, the the number of the comb lines you're stabilizing to. Um, here we are looking at the at a fairly novel and uh, alternative way of generating microwave generation, which relies on uh, the more like uh, newly discovered care frequency combs, where uh, we rely on the, on the non-linearity of a microresonator uh, to imprint a modulation uh, on, a, on top of a CW laser, and detecting that modulation yields the, the, the microwave signal. So before I talk about care frequency comb generation, I have to wrap up and, and do a bit, uh, uh, like uh, explain you a bit about the microresonator we're using. So this is like a, a magnesium fluoride, crystalline micro magnesium fluoride uh, type of resonator. And when you uh, put like a tapered optical fi fiber in the vicinity of this uh, protrusion, you excite a whispering gallery mode and that defines an optical cavity. And due to the uh, fairly small dimension of this, uh, of this resonator, you have like uh, a free spectral range on the order of 14 gigahertz. So magnesium fluoride is also a widely transparent material with small absorption. And that means that uh, the, the, the line width, the intrinsic line width we get with this resonator is like on the order of 100 kilohertz. So at, at 1550, that yields a quality factor on the order of 1 billion and the corresponding finesse of 10 to the 5. Uh, we have a fairly good light confinement uh, and uh, effective mode area on the order of uh, 100 uh, micron square. So still nowhere near like what uh, the group of Michal Lifton can uh, achieve. Um, and finally, we have a fairly important, param I mean, extremely important parameter in the, in the process of care comb generation, uh, which is dispersion. And magnesium fluoride has an uh, anomalous group velocity dispersion. And that's going to affect uh, the, the, the mode spectrum and yield like uh, an increasing free spectral range with respect to the uh, optical uh, frequency. Um, and so the way the, this dispersion is, is measured in microresonator is via this D2 parameter that uh, relates to the uh, group uh, velocity dispersion. And that essentially uh, shows by how much like the resonance of the, of the cavity is shifted with respect to uh, like uh, an equidistant, a purely equidistant uh, grid of frequency that is uh, marked by this dashed line. Um, so now let me focus on what's going on when we scan laser over one resonance of this, uh, of this resonator. So first it's at, at a low power. We start from the blue detune side and go toward the red detune. Low power of the laser, you have like a, a build up and this, this one has like a Lorentzian line, line shape. Then we increase the power, and uh, via the kern on linearity, the refractive index depends on the intensity. So we have a very high intensity, and that means uh, we are now shifting uh, the, the resonance together with the laser, and that uh, ultimately leads to like a splitting of the resonance, 
into a lower and upper branch. So we already have a bistable system in this uh, area. And now the effective zero detuning uh, is shifted toward the red detune side. At some point also, uh, we reach a so-called modulation instabi instability threshold uh, where we start to generate four wave mixing. So the, that means the initial uh, pump laser frequency is converted into sideband. Yeah, first a de degenerate four wave mixing process. Uh, and as those sidebands are growing, they also reach the nonlinear threshold and start to contribute to the, uh, to the generation of new, new frequencies via cascading effect. And also you have this time uh, a non-degenerate process. So that, uh, as Kerry Vala uh, mentioned, it, the, the whole system is well described by the Lugiato Lefebvre equation, which is a dam driven nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So you have here the, the damping term describing the losses of the cavity. Uh, you have here the driving uh, of the pump laser. So we have the, the nonlinearity here, the kernel linearity. And uh, here that's the dispersion term. And finally, like the, the detuning of the laser with respect to the cavity appears here. And it turns out that uh, you can find a table solutions to this equation uh, under the, the, I mean, as, as table cavity solitons. So they are called uh, uh, dissipative, temporal dissipative care solitons. Um, and they basically consist of uh, cyclic hyperbolic pulses that, they cycling, that are cycling around the, the, the cavity while maintaining the, the shape, their shape uh, and uh, amplitude, and that's uh, related to a dual, dual balance where the uh, anomalous scope velocity dispersion is compensated by the uh, nonlinearity, the care shift, and the losses on one side are balanced by the parametric gain, so the, the four wave mixing. And so now let me put everything together and explain you how you get uh, solitons. So we start with a strong laser that we scan from the blue detune side toward the red detune side. So that's the, the initial uh, optical spectrum showing the strong PEM laser. And you will reach uh, the, the modulation instability threshold. So at this point, we start to generate sidebands and that corresponds, if you look in, the, in terms of the intracavity uh, intensity profile to uh, like formation of roll patterns inside the resonator. We keep uh, tuning and put more power, so the, the comb grows, uh, but that leads like to a, to a sort of chaotic, we enter a sort of chaotic regime, and uh, at this point, okay, you have a frequency comb, but inside here you have nowhere like a, a pulse, and this is a very low coherent state that you cannot use for any kind of metallurgical application. But as we, we cross the, the effective red detuned side, you can see like this very strong uh, decrease in the intensity and then this step pattern. And that corresponds to uh, the, the formation of soliton inside the resonance. So this whole uh, random kind of waveform uh, is then collapsed into a, a series of uh, impulsion created in the resonator. So those are solitons. So at first you have several of them that uh, like uh, leads to an interference pattern in the, in the spectrum. But as you continue to tune the laser, what's hap essentially happening is that uh, the cavity cannot sustain that many solitons and you erase them one after the other and such that in, at this position of the tuning, uh, you're left with a single soliton in the, in the, in the micro resonator and uh, the optical spectrum then uh, fits nicely the, the expected uh, second hyperbolic. So, um, um, solitons have been demonstrated uh, in several um, microresonator platform now, uh, pretty recently actually, uh, and by different groups. So for instance, in the, in the silicon nitride, that's the, the work of my colleague, uh, Victor Brasch, where uh, by using some uh, dispersion trick, he managed to get like a dispersive wave such that he obtained this uh, frequency comb spanning uh, around two thirds of an octave. Um, also, so as Michelle Lipson mentioned, they, they managed to get uh, soliton in their, uh, uh, in their micro resonators as well. So for now, silicon nitrile are sort of limited to high repetition rates uh, that are not really in the detectable range. But so uh, in the group of Kerivahla, they, they have this uh, nice 
22 gigahertz frequency comb, I mean, sorry, sound frequency comb, where they showed already that uh, this corresponds to a fairly no, low noise state. And here I remind you of the, of the work of OE waves that showed the really, really nice uh, low noise results. So temporal dissipative solitons are uh, like intrinsically low noise state. And what, ah, yeah, just quickly uh, announcement. Uh, I'm happy to announce that today uh, the, the, we published an article in archive showing the self-referencing of this comb uh, spanning third of an octave. So yeah, coming back to our business, um, the, what we're like uh, ultimately interested in is knowing how good that system can be. Um, so that means understand and measure the noise transition going on in the, in the soliton generation process and determine the ultimate limits that, uh, that can occur. One of them was mentioned by, by uh, Andre Matsko, who is like the thermorefractive noise. Uh, and that means that this noise is, is just due to thermal fluctuation within the optical mode volume. That leads to uh, fluctuation in the FSR and therefore phase noise in the, in the microwave you can expect. Uh, good news is that magnesium fluoride has a fairly small uh, thermorefractive coefficient. So here I, I like put the expression for, for a model for a certain geometry. You can see, so it will depend on the, uh, on the variation of the refractive index with respect to the temperature. And it turns out that uh, in magnesium fluoride, due to the crystalline uh, type of material, you are like around two, on two orders of magnitude smaller than the, than the, the amorphous types of material. Um, we are also operating in a fairly large uh, effective mode area. So that's not so good for, in terms of care from generation, but that's good for noise because you average over a larger, uh, over a larger uh, area, and that means you, they can lead to smaller, um, uh, smaller fluctuations. Um, and so, if you put things together, you can expect like a very good uh, performance. I mean, ultimate performance uh, of the magnesium fluoride. So, also there are uh, other sources of noise process that can be introduced by the resonator. They are all uh, fairly well uh, and thoroughly described by, uh, in this paper but they should more or less uh, be on the same order. So, okay, now let me explain how we, we uh, generate solitons using a narrow line with laser. So that's just a, the simple scheme you can think of without any, any uh, narrow line with uh, effect. So you use a pump laser, uh, erbium dot fiber amplifier. So here we, we operate around 200 milliwatt of pump power it into the crystalline resonator, and then we need to notch out the, the, the pump light that is not coupled to the cavity, and then analyze, detect the microwave beat and analyze it. And so the way we generate the soliton is that we need to tune the laser, as I said uh, previously. So we generate a, a frequency, a ramp using a function generator, and that ramp will just like scan the laser across the nonlinear resonance until you reach the desired soliton step, and then whoop, you stop. The, the scan and you, you have a single, oh, I mean, uh, uh, so the, you have reached your desired soliton state. So we need to, to preserve that uh, tunability while uh, narrowing the laser of the, uh, the line width of the laser. Um, and for that, we implement an offset lock to, uh, to a reference, optical reference. So we take our pump laser and beat it with this uh, reference laser, divide that bit note by, uh, by a factor 60 to match our locking electronic and then compare the phase with the local oscillator and then servo back uh, on the pump laser and using also uh, an acousto-optic modulator. So the kind uh, of cavity we're using are provided by uh, Menlo. So here I show some of the data they, they provided us. When they beat at Menlo two of these cavity together, they, they have like a, an extremely narrow line with bit note, showing like a 0.3 hertz type of line width. And, uh, the stability of this system is, uh, is remarkably good on the order of uh, 10 to the minus uh, 15. And so the way we, we get the soliton now is first we connect that function generator and scan uh, the laser to get into the desired soliton step. So here I highlight the, the soliton existence range. Um, and then we want to narrow the line width of this guy. Um, what we do is that like we measure precisely the offset, the existing offset between the reference laser and the pump in the, in the precise achieved state by using that counter. And then 
we match closely the LO to that frequency and enable the lock. That way we can preserve uh, the, the soliton state. Uh, and that also uh, means we, also, we keep a certain tunability when the laser is locked by tuning the local oscillator. In terms of uh, locking up the laser, here's a comparison uh, with like before and after locking. Um, so in the unlock state, we measure basically the, the line width of, the, of our initial uh, pump laser, which is a fiber laser, which has a typical line width of, on the order of a few tens of kilohertz. And then when they build the lock and you see that all the data is like compressed into the, the coherent spike here. And if you like run a, a frequency a noise measurement on that bit node, you can see that we have like a, a white phase noise so that our actuation bandwidth is essentially like, uh, around 90 uh, kilohertz. And we are able with the, the current electronics we are using to uh, achieve a locking with offset on the range of uh, one to almost uh, around 10 gigahertz. So almost uh, spanning one a spectral range of the cavity. And so what, that's what we observed. So we were really happy to have this new toy. So we started to generate soliton, try to lock and all that, and this is what we, we observed, observed at first. Um, so here, I, I plot here that the color code is like blue, la the laser is unlocked, and then we lock it. So we have like no change uh, in, the, in the optical spectrum between the two states. So that means we are able to preserve quite precisely the, the soliton state. And then we look at the microwave signal, and we see like around uh, 100 hertz, a 40 dB reduction. So that means, well, in fact, soliton states are really uh, sensitive to the, to the input noise we're, we're putting in. And that's just to mention, not the hard limit, uh, like at, at this uh, offset, we're in fact limited by the, by the measurement device, which is the uh, Rodenschaft's uh, FSW. Uh, just to mention, I mean, this is not so great performance uh, here at all, but, uh, we are not like putting a much power, too much power. I mean, we are not careful at all uh, on that experiment. So we had, in fact, fairly, fairly little signals. But then we repeated that again with a different soliton state. So this one is a two soliton. And well, this time between the lock and unlocked state, there was no, no significant difference. We were already at the, at the FSW, I mean, at, at the ESA limit. And well, that, that's kind of really, really surprising to us. The, there are some states of the soliton that are natively less sensitive to the pump noise, while others are, are much more. Um, the problem here is that we had no way to quantify, I mean, to evaluate this, because we, we ran that many times, and even in the single soliton state, we were able to replicate somewhat those type of behavior. Um, so we, we step back and try to start of thinking of ways to, to really characterize how, the, how, how is the soliton state. Um, and one very important uh, parameter is actually the, the, the pump detuning with respect to the cavity. So here I, I, I show again the, the soliton ansatz. And uh, so you have in the soliton state a, continuous, a weak continuous background plus uh, the second hyperbolic uh, component of the, of the soliton, and actually its duration depends on the laser detuning with respect to the cavity, and phi here is just a normalized time with respect to the, to the three spectral range. And so plotting this uh, in the, the sort of rotating frame, you have in blue here, that would be like the weak CW component, and in red, that's the, the soliton component. So as I said before, the, most of the cavity here in the, in the blue regime uh, is actually resonant at this position, so at higher frequency than the pump, because in the soliton regime, the pump is red detuned with respect to the cavity. But there is then also the part that overlaps with the soliton, and this one experiences a very strong intensity due to the presence of the pulse. And again, we have the curve shift. Uh, so that means that this resonance, I mean, the, the, this part of the of the cavity is now resonant at this lower frequency such that it's effectively blue detuned with respect to the pump. Uh, and that actually explains why the, the solitons remain stable within the cavity, although we're uh, red detuned. Um, 
And we found out that you can actually probe the position of these two resonance by putting like modulation, sweeping modulation sidebands around the laser and detect what's this, uh, where is in this resonance and this one. So that's done using a network analyzer that provides the frequency sweep and then using an electro-optic modulator to phase modulate uh, the input laser, co couple the cavity, and then uh, record the response on a photodiode and demodulate on the network analyzer. And that's the response we observe on the, on the instrument. That typical uh, double resonance feature. So we are probing symmetrically with respect to the, to the uh, pump laser. So essentially the pump laser would be here. And then we fold both, both sides of the, of the picture I showed you previously. And there you see this first resonance that corresponds to the, the part of the cavity overlapping with the solid pump. And then the higher uh, frequency resonance uh, gives essentially uh, with a very good approximation the, the, the position of the, of the cold cavity. So we are able here by detecting this peak to measure the effective detuning to the cavity in the, while we are in the soliton state. So we say, okay, great. We need to implement that on our setup. So here we go. Uh, we place the, uh, the network analyzer and so on with the probing uh, system and then realize, in fact, we have access now to the detuning. We can do a feedback and stabilize this value. So we just now read out, so it's just purely digital uh, feedback, pretty slow. Uh, we read out the network analyzer, detect uh, the, the cavity peak, and then feedback when, when the two lasers are locked, we feedback on the, on the tunable uh, local oscillator, such that essentially we can set a given detuning values and this laser will follow the cavity. One issue here, and that's kind of a problem, is that we, I mean, the, the free spectrum is still free to drift. Um, so here are some results uh, about the, the, the stabilization. Um, so what you see there in this map is essentially like we aggregate all the network analyzer trace as we are acquiring them. So here is time, that's the modulation frequency, and then like the third axis would be like the modulation response. So you see that's the cavity, and that's the soliton. So the soliton is pretty much locked to the pump. It stays there at all times. Uh, but then we, we are doing nothing and the cavity is drifting away. And then we enable the lock and then the, the, the effective detuning is locked to this uh, 10 megahertz uh, value. And then 15 hours later, I come back, disable the lock and put the, the soliton starts drifting. I mean, the cavity drifts away and we lose the soliton quite in, within a few minutes. Uh, so I mentioned the FSR is still free to drift and that's like uh, how it looks like uh, overnight. So, I mean, as usual with the, <coughs> with the type of overnight measurement, you always wonder what on earth is happening at night at TPFL. <laughs> and maybe I should not say that in front of my PI, but you can actually like monitor when the PhD students are coming back in the lab around nine uh, AM, where you have like this sort of uh, violent jump on the rep rate. Um, <clears throat> okay, and so with this uh, ability to, to uh, control the effective detuning, we could also uh, sweep the value. So we start like with the, so those two uh, show like the comp state and the detuning value uh, in, in two different regimes, and that's like what's, what's happening in between. So. We start with a fairly small detuning value, so that's the soliton peak, that's the resonance, and we have like a fairly narrow comb, and then we, uh, we detune further and further uh, <coughs> until we, like, we arrive into this regime where like the, the soliton resonance is like at this position and we are like uh, around at 20 megahertz detuning. That's quite remarkable, I mean, it's remarkably far away from the initial resonance. Uh, if you look in terms of the, uh, of the, cold, I mean the, the cavity line width, that is around 100 kilohertz, that means we are 280 times uh, the, the cavity detuned. Uh, so that, that's pretty uh, extremely bistable uh, regime of the cavity. And in that case, the, the, the spectrum is much, uh, much broader. So then we fit, I mean, at each of these steps, we, we measure the spectrum, we can fit uh, second hyperbolic to retrieve the pulse duration within the cavity. And uh, therefore we plot here the effective detuning versus the, the pulse duration. And we see that it fits nicely 
uh, the theoretical expression. There, there's no free parameter. The Z2 value is the, the cavity dispersion who was measured previously. Uh, so that's where we stand. We have this ability to uh, probe now the solid tone uh, position, I mean the detuning position. Uh, that way we can determine quite uh, precisely what's the optical uh, spectrum within that state. Um, <clears throat> and so we worked also recently on trying to enhance um, our microwave noise. So the point now is that we have drifts, so we cannot explore uh, in this region uh, by making like a cross correlation to reduce below the, 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 the instrument limitations. Um, so then we amplified the pulse um, to reach a higher optical uh, power. And we see that we were able to, to get closer to the shot noise floor here. We're probably paying the, the, the price of the noise figure of the uh, optical amplifier we, were, we are using. Uh, so there are still many improvements to do. We still have uh, issues with our uh, lock between the two lasers because we're injecting servo bumps. Uh, in this region here, we're actually injecting uh, phase modulation sidebands from the VNA, so that could explain why we have this sort of weird uh, shape in the, on the background. Um, and of course, what we need to do is get rid of those drifts or those thermal drifts uh, to measure closer to the carrier. <coughs> so in summary, um, we demonstrated the, the, that soliton generation on top of a, an ultra narrow line with laser is possible, uh, and that this way you can get uh, low noise microwave generation. Uh, very interesting is that soliton state can be natively immune, in fact, to the pump uh, noise, so we still need to quantify by how much, I mean, in which condition this uh, occurs. Um, and I've presented a way to control uh, the soliton state. Um, okay, well, I'll stop on that. And I would like to thank, to thank uh, especially John Jost, who helped me a lot on the experiment. Uh, Tobias Hare, who did the first discovery of the, of the soliton in the microresonators. Caroline Le Caplain, who is uh, working on the, on the crystalline team at the EPFL and my PI. Uh, Tobias Kippenberg uh, for his uh, uh, advices. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. I'd be glad to answer to your questions.